It's amazing when you think about it, how much our landscape has been changed by the drainage of wetlands. We're gonna be looking at wetlands today and how they were drained and how so many areas were filled in over the years. If we were to go back in time 300 years and venture outdoors, we would see wetlands scattered throughout the landscape. We would see them on hills, we would see them in valleys. And in visiting these wetlands, you'd find muskrat lodges like the one in this photo in the center of the wetland areas. And there would be cattails all over the place. In fact, these cattails would be surrounding the wetland areas that we see. And the waterfall would be amazing. The sound of the ducks taking off from the wetlands as we approached would be almost deafening. That's changed over the years. And it's changed gradually to the point that few people can remember uh, the abundance of wetlands that were once present outdoors. But if we were to go into the valleys years ago and visit and walk them, we would find beaver. And the beaver would be quite abundant on landscape. And the dams that the beaver built would have built many other wetland areas. In fact, it would have been really difficult to cross some of these valleys because of the abundance of wetlands and beaver ponds and swamps that were present at that time. If we were to get up on a high mountain and look out over the valley, we would see a landscape quite a bit different than we see today. Here we see a landscape out of Alaska that has not been changed by wetland drainage. And what we're looking at here are a series of wetlands that have formed over the years as the river has changed channel. And the entire riparian area is saturated. The higher ground is growing trees and shrubs, but all the lower ground uh, contains marshes and other types of wetlands like uh, shrub swamps and uh, emergent wetlands and wet meadows. And when there'd be a rain, the water would flow across the valley. And in the early readings about freshets or heavy rains, what was described is how the water would spread out over the valley in a sheet-like pattern. And it would just saturate the soils. And again, the riparian area would be quite wet. And in this, we're using many, many of the plants that were growing in and near the wetland areas. And we see this beautiful basket that was made by hand that was uh, constructed using sedge roots, bracken fern roots, willow, and red bud. And indigenous folks used the bulrushes in the wetlands to make worm carriers so they could go fishing in other wetlands. Here we're looking at shoes that were made out of cattails, which grow in wetland areas. And here we're looking at uh, an Osage mat uh, that was made using bulrushes. And people would use the many plants found in wetland areas, not only for food, but for clothing and for housing. But the Europeans who were moving across North America 300, 200 years ago, they had a different idea about how to make a living. They purchased land, they sold land, and they raised crops on the land. And with these crops, they could feed their families and they could also sell the excess to make a living. And here's one of the earliest photos that I found showing land being cleared. You see the low areas were dominated by wetlands and they were too wet to farm. And so the higher ground is what was cleared for farming. And here these folks are by hand, uh, removing trees and shrubs and plowing ground for the first time so they could plant their crops. Much of this land on higher ground had a slope to it. And when the rains came, it washed. Erosion occurred, gullies formed, and the land you're looking at here can no longer be farmed. It has too many gullies, so if you try to plow it on the contour, it's impossible. You would get stuck. Your equipment wouldn't be able to make it across the gullies. So what do you do? Here you are trying to make a living farming this land that you work so hard to clear. And here's another example. Here's a field that was cleared recently, and it's on higher ground with a slope of maybe two or three percent. There was a heavy rain and look at the erosional gullies that are already forming. You can't farm this anymore and the soil's all washing downhill. So there had to be a better way to raise crops and not have erosion. 
Well, here's a quote that I found. When water stands in a field for any length of time, it is a sure sign that land needs drainage. And what was happening is that people were attempting to farm the low areas or the wetlands. And maybe in a dry year, they were successful in raising a crop. But in most years, what happened is that the rains came and the water stood in the fields and their crops drowned. And at harvest time, if rains came early in the fall, it was a real problem for the farmer. Now, this cart was full of corn that was harvested by hand. And here the farmer is trying to move it out of the field and to their uh, barn and then the, where they could sell it. Well, what happened is the cart got stuck in the mud of a wetland area because the rains came early. And imagine the hard work involved of having to unload each ear of corn to try to keep it clean, and then to try to get the horse and the cart out of the mud. So people realized early on that it was important, in fact, essential to drain these wet areas so they could raise the crops. Now, I know this is an odd photograph right here. You're looking at a couple of refrigeration trucks, but I put these in here to show us that refrigeration trucks are a relatively new invention in the 1940s. And up until the 1940s, it was essential that you raise your food close to where you're living. What was important to do was to clear land near where you were living to plant those seeds and to use that food quickly or to try to store it in between blocks of ice so it wouldn't spoil during the summer. But with the advent of the refrigeration truck, we could afford the luxury of having our food raised in distant areas and brought to us fresh. Now these folks really look hungry. These are miners and they are hungry and they're working in remote locations. Well, to feed them, they had to clear land close to the camp and raise the crops that were necessary for making the food to feed this many people. And think of all the logging camps and all the mining camps in remote areas. People had to farm close to their camps in order to feed themselves. And so when looking for a place to restore a wetland, uh, oftentimes we find farm fields in places where we had never imagined that farming would have taken place. Here we are trying to farm a wetland in the 1900s. And yes, people did farm wetland areas. And this wetland was plowed directly and raised up in beds that we call lands for farming. And here is a farm field that was made by creating land. My grandfather talked to me years ago about making land. I really didn't know what he was saying, but now I understand what he was meaning is that they would take swamps and wetlands and they would directionally plow them to raise up ridges of soil in the center. And they would farm these ridges or these beds that we call lands. And the area where they remove the soil is called the dead furrow. And if you ever see this pattern on the landscape, we're looking at wetlands that have been farmed. And here's John Newman, he is standing on a land, and this is one of many lands that his grandfather built years ago in the 1800s. Uh, what his grandfather did is that he cleared the area and then he dug ditches. And then what he did is that he plowed it with a horse and a mule scoop. And what he did is he raised up the land in the middle so it could be farmed. It's not the best way of farming, but it's better than nothing. And here's another field that has been farmed in lands for many years. This is a wetland and it's a farmed wetland. It takes a lot of work to maintain a field in lands because the shrubs and the trees will grow in the dead furrows and they will pull moisture from your lands and they will also shade your crops. So it's a lot of handwork involved when using this practice to farm. Now, the person in this photo is digging a ditch and it's really difficult to find photographs of people digging ditches. And I've learned why. It's the social part of it. If you're digging a ditch, more than likely you're hot, you're sweaty, you're tired, you're muddy, and you're not enjoying your job. You're digging a ditch to drain water away from the land so that it can be farmed. And if somebody approaches you with a camera, more than likely you're gonna get yelled at or strongly invited to grab a shovel and to help them dig a ditch. And digging a ditch is again, not something you wanna do every day, 
and you do it because you're having a real problem with water. These folks are having a real problem with water here and they're trying to dry the landscape. So what they're doing here is that they're digging this deep ditch and long ditch by hand. And as they're digging it, the water's coming into the bottom of the ditch and I'm sure the mosquitoes were swarming and it's just a long tiring day to do this. And ditches could be dug, were dug that were quite deep. And here we have what's called the big ditch being dug near Freewell, uh, New York. And this required the help of many, many people to dig these ditches. I've come across uh, publications from the early 1900s where they talk about the best ditch is the one dug by humans. But with everybody fighting in World War I, uh, it's important to start using machines to dig these ditches because people are not available to dig that many of them. Now, oftentimes we don't think of ditches being dug in the West where it's drier. But I assure you that many ditches were dug in the west and the southwest. And in this uh, photo, we see a hay field. And in the hay field, what we see are haystacks. And this shows us that the hay was harvested by hand. And there's a shallow ditch to the person on the right. There's a shallow drainage ditch. But what's most notable is the aqueduct. What they were doing here is that they were moving water in for irrigation and they were removing excess water for drainage. So in the spring in California, it's quite wet and they needed drainage ditches, but then come summer, it would turn dry and they would need to move water in for irrigation. Well, digging ditches by hand was one of the hardest jobs a person could do. So people looked for shortcuts. And after World War I, there was a tremendous amount of dynamite that was available. And the US government and the Canadian government distributed this dynamite after the war, free of charge to farmers. And the farmers would use the surplus dynamite to dig ditches to drain wetlands for farming. And here we have a ditch that was dug using explosives in the state of Minnesota. This is a deep ditch, and you can see what it did to the elevation of groundwater. It lowered it, and then they were able to remove the trees and farm this field. Uh, here's the, it looks like a natural stream, but this ditch was also created by using dynamite in the 1940s and 1950s. And we know it's a ditch because it's straight and it's located on level ground and on level ground, the stream should be sinuous and should contain a number of beaver ponds and flowages. But here it's straight and it's steep sided. And there are really very few piles of soil along the edge. And the explosives were very effective at making this ditch so that the wetland could be drained for farming. Here is a demonstration taking place in the state of New York where dynamite is being used to remove soil that is washed into ditches. You see, when you dig a ditch to drain a wetland, there's a tremendous amount of erosion and ditches downstream would soon be filled with soil. And it's really tough to clean out these ditches, especially by hand, because you sink in the mud. So people would use explosives to clean out these ditches so they would be um, as effective as they were when they were built. Now, people came up with ways of digging ditches that were much easier than digging them by hand. Uh, here we see a demonstration of a Fresno scraper. And the Fresno scraper was developed in California and used throughout the West. And it was used to dig ditches to drain excess water from wetlands and as well as to move in water for irrigation. In the East, a mule scoop was used. Uh, these folks are using a mule scoop which looks a lot like a wheelbarrow, but it doesn't have a wheel and the handles are much shorter. And here they are digging drainage ditches with that meal scoop. And I'm on the left here and Merlin Spencer, who is now deceased, is showing us how to use a mule scoop. He demonstrated the use of this tool, which he and his father and grandfather used to drain wetlands on the farm. And you have to hold the handles just right at the perfect angle so the front of the mule scoop will dig into the ground. 
If you lift up on the handles too much, it will bite in and throw you over the front. If you don't lift up on the handles, it will skid across the surface and not dig a ditch. So while you're operating this, you have to take care of at least two animals, horses and mules, and make sure they're going in the right direction. So this is some of the earliest multitasking I've seen running one of these mule scoops. People also came up with V plows. This is an A-frame plow and it has a metal leading edge. And look at the technology involved here. They dug the ditch on a correct slope, too steep, but with a road too gradual, it wouldn't drain the wetland. They had to control two teams of animals here, and they had to get rid of the excess soil so it didn't back up water on either side of the ditch. Well, we're looking at a stream here, and this is in the state of Virginia, but it's really a ditch. And this ditch was hand dug in the 1700s by slaves. And it's still working today to drain the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, the ditch was dug um, so that the land could be developed and sold and farmed. The owner of the company that had the slaves out there was George Washington, the first president of the United States. Uh, George Washington was a surveyor and a land speculator, and he would put in these drainage systems and then subdivide and turn a profit. So what does a ditch do? This is something that's really important to remember, is that a ditch will eliminate standing water and a ditch will lower the elevation of groundwater. And this is a drawing from a book in the 1950s that was published by the US government and it describes the value of a ditch. So when you see a ditch on the landscape, you can assume that at one time, groundwater was near the surface, and at one time, there was water standing in areas on the surface. So where are ditches placed? Again, this is an old drawing showing how to drain areas for farming. First of all, you place a ditch along the base of the hill or the mountain, and this is a ditch that diverts runoff and catches the runoff from tributaries and directs it into a deeper ditch located further down in the valley. And also many times a deeper ditch was dug down the center of the valley where the ground was lowest. And this made an artificial stream or a straightened stream. And this would also lower the elevation of groundwater so that the adjoining fields these people are standing in the center of a diversion ditch. The diversion ditch was dug along the base of the hill here. And you can see it's really a subtle feature on the landscape. It's not eroding. It's on a slope of less than one half of 1%. And maybe you've been in a valley and you've decided to walk up the hill. And as you're walking up the hill, you find a depression and then you continue to climb up the hill. Well, more than likely that depression is a diversion ditch that shows that the valley was once farmland and now it's grown up to trees. Here's the construction of a diversion ditch. What's happening here is that this ditch is designed to divert water from the tributary that's located up valley and to place it on a gradual slope, so gradual that it won't erode. And the construction of these ditches took the use required the use of tape measures as well as levels, optical levels, or transits, so that we wouldn't have uh, too steep of a slope that would cause erosion. Now, diversion ditches can be difficult to find, but one way you can locate them is using LIDAR images. And we're looking at a LIDAR image here. And LIDAR images are where you take a laser and you actually photograph the ground. And you can see clearly here the diversion ditch uh, that is still working. Uh, this photo was taken in South Carolina and the area is covered with dense trees, but the LIDAR was able to pick up on the presence of ditches that were dug by hand in the 1700s. Well, here we see what's called a drag line. And the drag line here is digging a ditch along one side of the field. And we can see some puddles out in the field. 
Now, this is a army surplus drag line that was used by uh, different units of government uh, to drain wetlands for farmers after the Korean War. And what we're looking at here is what happens when you dig a ditch. When you dig a ditch, the ditch starts pulling in water from the surrounding soil and it forms a stream. So the stream you see in the bottom of this ditch was created by the groundwater and by the draining of the wetland area. And if you look across the other side of the field, you'll see piled soil from where they dug a ditch, a diversion ditch on the other side of the field. And these become streams and people look at them and say they're natural streams when really they're ditches. Now, after the soil dried, they came back and what they did is that they leveled that soil pile and they used that soil to fill in the wetlands that you can see. And soil from digging ditches was almost always used to fill in wetlands nearby. Well, here's Mr. Kofer, and he is standing next to a diversion ditch that was dug many years ago. And you can see it's located at the base of a hill, but the area has not been intensively farmed. If it was intensely farmed, they would not have allowed trees to grow up near the diversion ditch because these shade the farm field. So the roots will work to block the ditches, but the ditch is still functioning here. Now, does this look like a natural stream or an artificial stream? Well, you notice how straight it is. You notice the steep banks. Well, this is a dug ditch, and the ditch was dug down the center of the valley to drain the adjacent land for farming. And this ditch was designed and built by an engineer, and the engineer was paid for by local landowners who placed a tax on themselves and formed a drainage district. So they believe so strongly in drainage that they formed this drainage district and gave up their own money so they could have this drainage system. And to give you an idea how dedicated they were, uh, they were using very primitive farming techniques. And how do we know that? I can ask you, how many horsepower tractors were they using? at the time that this ditch was dug. And you look at the photo and you say, what's he talking about? How many horsepower tractors? Well, they didn't have tractors. They didn't have tractors at the time because that haystack on the right shows us that they were harvesting the hay using horses and using rakes and doing most of this work by hand. But this showed how convinced people were that drainage could improve their livelihood and their fields for many, many years to come. We're looking here at a large drag line that was used to straighten and channel streams to drain large wetland areas. And Oftentimes we're curious how effective are these large ditches that were dug down the center of valleys? Well, here's a quote from 1879. The writer has known of cases where a deep open drain has dried out marshes and swamps through which it has passed for a distance of more than one mile on either side of the banks. Amazing. You can dig one of these deep ditches in a valley and drain wetlands up to a mile away. So how is that possible? Well, in the digging of these deep ditches, they intercepted a permeable layer of gravel or sand. And when you're digging a ditch, if you intercept a permeable layer, you can pull water from well over a mile away. So if you see one of these deep ditches on the landscape, it can be draining wetlands quite a distance away. Here's one of these deep ditches that it encounters a permeable layer. We're looking at Meadow Creek, and um, this is the north end of Kootenai Lake in British Columbia. And this is Terry Halloran, uh, who is the third generation uh, to own this farm. And his grandfather years ago worked to build a railroad right where the road is located. And what they did is they dug this deep ditch for Meadow Creek, and they used the soil to build up the railroad grade. Now they've taken out the railroad grade and replaced it with a road, 
but the moved and channeled stream still drains the wetland areas on either side for quite a distance. Here, here we see another one of these deep channeled streams or ditches near Creston, BC. And again, this interrupts a permeable layer and is draining wetlands for a considerable distance on either side. So what I have found is that the majority of streams that we see near agricultural land are really ditches. And they're artificial ditches, and they were dug to drain wetlands and connected wetlands. So in looking at this stream, yes, it's a stream, but really it's a ditch. And it was a ditch that was used to drain large areas of wetlands. Now, when you dig a ditch to drain a wetland or to move a stream, you trigger what's called a head cut to form. What is a head cut? A head cut is a waterfall and the waterfall is moving through soil, not through rock. We all know about Niagara Falls. It's a waterfall that goes over rock. And Niagara Falls is actually moving upstream. I've heard that it's actually moving up valley at a rate of almost a meter a year. Well, when you dig a ditch to drain a wetland, you cause head cuts to form or these waterfalls. And what they do is they cause a deepening of the stream channel and a widening of the stream channel. And they move up valley with each runoff event. And what causes a head cut to form? It's a lowering of the base elevation of the stream. So if you lower a stream by digging a ditch, you cause the head cuts to move up valley. And what do they do? They drain wetlands, and I say they unzip wetlands. I want you to think of a head cut like a zipper. It unzips something. A head cut will unzip and drain a wetland and cause a tremendous amount of erosion. And here is a head cut in action during a runoff event. And there's quite a bit of velocity here of the water going over that waterfall or head cut. And this head cut moves about half a meter uphill each year. And I've come across head cuts that have been moving for hundreds of years, and they were all started by the digging of ditches to drain wetlands. Here we are on um, near Quamichan Lake on Vancouver Island. And Jason is standing at the base of a head cut. Now there's a bit of a story about this. We're standing in what used to be a swamp in some marsh areas but they were all drained in the late 1800s for farming. And they were drained using ditches. And the ditch is really shown by the red arrow and the pink flag. And the ditch has, is fairly narrow and the banks are not very high. But what happened is that a development was formed on the mountain up valley, you know, up on top of the mountain, they leveled it and they, put in this development and all the runoff now rushes down into the ditch. Well, that increase in runoff, the flashiness of it caused head cuts to form in the ditch. And now these head cuts are causing a deepening and widening of the ditch channel and tremendous amounts of soil are now washing into Quamichan Lake. So these head cuts move with every rain. And if you photograph them and measure them, you'll be amazed at the erosion that's caused by head cut. Uh, here we have a head cut in the state of uh, New Mexico. Now, if you look up valley, there is no stream channel. There's only a wet meadow. And the water flows across the surface in a sheet-like pattern. Well, what happened is cattle were introduced and people with their wagons drove up the wet meadow and the cattle formed trails and the wagons formed trails and ruts from the wheels. This concentrated the runoff. It lowered the base elevation in the valley and it caused head cuts to form. So this head cut is close to four meters vertical and it's actually devouring the wetland and causing a tremendous amount of erosion. Well, here we're looking at a diversion ditch that was dug along the base of the hill and the head cuts have moved up the diversion ditch and the erosion is so great that it's eroded down to bedrock. 
And what we see here is really poor habitat in this diversion ditch. We don't have the pools, we don't have the riffles, but we do have a lot of erosion. And the velocities are so great that invertebrates have a hard time surviving in this uh, dug ditch. Okay, historically, there was no stream with bed and banks in this valley. Historically, there was a wet meadow with beaver ponds and swamp, more than likely uh, western red cedar. But what happened is the western red cedar were cut and removed, and this ditch was dug down the center of the valley to drain the area for farming. Okay, there are problems with digging ditches. One of the problems with digging ditches is they fill with soil and they don't work as well as they used to. So you have to redig them. But the biggest problem with ditches is they separate your farm field into two fields. So if you have a ditch on your property, you know that it's not easy to cross that ditch. You have to maintain a culvert or a bridge and that comes at quite an expense. So people learned that if they dig ditches, guess what, their fields are half the size and there's a lot of erosion and a lot of maintenance associated with digging ditches. And if you dig ditches, the beaver can block the ditch with a beaver dam. So that means you have to work to remove the beaver dam and the beaver so that you can farm your fields. So early on, people learned there was a better way to digging ditches. They would dig ditches to drain the wetlands for farming, but in the bottom of the ditches, they would place rock or they would place wood structures. And then they would fill in over the rock or the, or the wood and farm over the top and the ditch would not separate their field into two. So this way of putting uh, rock underground was first uh, illustrated by Henry French in the late 1800s. And people now call rock drains, French drains, but Henry French was really advocating a different type of drainage using clay tiles. Well, here's an early wood box drain. It's a three-sided box, it doesn't have a bottom. And this was uncovered in New York in the 1950s and it was still working to drain water from the wetland. It was buried in the ground. And uh, the red arrow shows the location of a buried box that was used to drain wetlands on John Newman's farm. Uh, this box was buried in the ground in the late 1800s by John Newman's grandfather, and it continues to carry water today. Uh, what happens is water seeps into the box um, in the side that is not covered, the bottom of the box, and is carried downstream in this underground ditch until another moves stream, and this drains the wetland area. This is a beautiful farm field. And this is on a farm in Eastern Kentucky in Menifee County. And there are several signs that this used to be wetland. Uh, one that you can't see is that a wood box was buried in the ground in the 1800s to drain the wetland and is still carrying water today. Another sign is that there's a depression. And the depression has clay soils, but it's not wet. That tells us that this has been a drained wetland. But the best is that um, pin oak tree that you see. That pin oak tree, that large, beautiful tree, is buttressed at the base. And this is one of the original trees from before the wetland was drained. Many wetlands were drained by digging ditches and by putting logs in them or poles in them. And this was a common way of draining wetlands, especially if you were trying to drain a swamp for farming. And we're looking at what used to be a swamp here with beaver ponds. And this swamp was drained using these wood pole drains. And we were working on a wetland restoration and we were digging what's called a core trench around the lower perimeter of the wetland that we were restoring. And the excavator is digging away and suddenly water gushes into the trench. I thought we hit a main water pipe, but after we bailed the water out, we found out that we hit a buried wood pole drain that was probably installed in the late 1700s and it was still carrying water along the length of it to drain the wetland above. And we pulled these logs out and they were perfectly preserved. 
If you bury this wood in the ground to drain wetlands and it stays saturated, the wood will never decompose. Here we're looking at what used to be wetland area and it was drained by digging a diversion ditch on either side and by installing wood pole drains throughout the field. Here we're working on a wetland restoration project on Cortez Island in BC. And while we were digging the core trench, we encountered these wood pole drains that were buried in the ground a little over a meter below the surface. And what happened here is that this was a swamp with beaver ponds and they cut the trees, removed the stumps, dug the ditches to drain the wetland. And then what they did is they put the trees that they cut in the ditches and they piled them next to each other and then covered over the top with soil. And these wood drains were still draining the wetland above. Here we have a rock drain on Salt Spring Island, BC. We are building a wetland area here. And while we are digging the core trench um, for the groundwater dam, we encountered this buried rock drain. And this is an interesting one because it has a cavity or a cave in it. And this was buried about 30, 40 centimeters below the surface. And the water was traveling in between the rocks and in that cavity. And it was effectively draining the wetland above. And this is what the surface of that field looks like. It looks like any other field in BC. And it's really hard to tell that there was ever a rock drain in here. There's an occasional patch of sedges that indicate the area was once wetland. And here we're working in Hector, New York on the Finger Lakes National Forest. The red line shows the center of a rock drain that we uncovered during construction of the wetland. And here we are uh, in Victoria. We uncovered this rock drain at the Halliburton Farm um, on Vancouver Island and the rock drain was still carrying water. This is a rock drain that was installed um, on the farm near Quamichan Lake. And the rock drain is exactly one foot below the surface and it measures one foot by one foot. And it was filled with a very fine rock that would carry water beneath the surface. Here's a sign that there may be a rock drain in a field. Look for a vertical hole in the ground a vertical hole that hasn't been dug by animals. And this can show you that there was, you know, there is a rock drain that's still functioning. I'd like you to remember and to learn about John Johnston. John Johnston grew up in Scotland. And when he was a young man, he left his family and he traveled to the United States. And he said, I'm going to make my fortune in the U.S. So he looked around for a place to take to buy a farm and he went to the bank and took out loans and he bought this farm and built this farmhouse near the community of Geneva. And Geneva is near Lake Seneca, one of the Finger Lakes. So he built this home and he said, all right, I'm gonna get in a year or two of good crop production. And then I'm gonna call for my family to move over. Well, he had the fields plowed and after plowing the fields, he planted wheat and barley and oats. And then the rains came and water stood on his fields. And that first year, he only got five bushels of grain per acre. And this was bad news because back then in the 1800s, if you didn't pay your debts on your loan, you went to prison, debtor's prison. So he remembered spending time with his grandfather in Scotland and what they did is that they were making clay tile to drain wood. So he sent a letter to his grandfather and his grandfather sent over by ship two of these clay tiles. And he went to his friend, uh, Mr. Wartonby in the town of Waterloo, New York. And he asked him to start making these clay tiles for him. Now, Wartonby had no idea what these clay tiles were for. He had never seen them before. No one had ever used them in North America. So Wartonby started making 3,000 of these for John Johnston. And Wartonby was happy to do this because his customers were not coming back to him. His main business was making crocks for whiskey. 
And what they did is they used lead in the glaze and many of his customers were becoming poisoned. So a chance to make clay tile was a really good way to diversify his business. So what happened is John Johnson borrowed some survey equipment and he started surveying areas where water was on his farm. And he tried to figure out how could he dig ditches to drain the water out of these. So he started hiring people who were laid off from hand digging the Erie Canal. And they started digging ditches all over his farm. And in these ditches, he placed the clay tiles in the ground. And he placed the clay tiles right up against each other. And then he covered them with soil. And he placed these clay tiles deep in the ground on bedrock, which was anywhere from one to one and a half meters below the surface. And people came by and saw what he was doing. And they said, John Johnson, you are a fool. You are burying crockery in the ground. Certainly you will go broke and have to go back to Scotland in disgrace. Well, he stayed with the plan and he continued to put these clay tile in the ground and continued to cover them with soil. And what happened? They worked. Here we have a wetland before the installation of clay tile and a wetland after. The crops were able to grow because the soil was no longer saturated. Now here we're looking at how tile drainage improves fields. They call these clay pipes tiles. So before we have shallow water wetlands, after we have corn being produced. And it's too bad this photo isn't in color. If it was in color, you would see that the corn in the upper photo before drainage, it's yellow, has no ears on it. Following drainage, the corn is tall and green and it's up to two ears of corn on it. So the drainage really worked on John Johnston's farm. And the way John Johnston described how the drain tile worked, he says, think of a flower pot that has a hole in the bottom of it. If you plug that hole, more than likely your plant will die because the roots will be saturated. And he says, think of a farm field as a huge flower pot. It needs a hole in the bottom. And what drain tiles do is they provide that drainage where excess water can be removed and the roots will not be saturated. So here's how drain tile work. We were working on a wetland restoration project. We dug a series of test holes and one of the test holes, we cut through these buried drain tile. And we left the hole open up overnight, came back the next morning and you can see where the groundwater elevation has stabilized at the elevation of the drain tile. So plants are able to grow in a drier zone between the drain tile and the surface. And of course, plants can't grow in that saturated zone below the drain tile. Well, people started using drain tile because they heard about what John Johnson was doing. And they started manufacturing drain tile that were 12 inches long and round. And even poor people started buying these drain tile because of how effective they were and how these drain tile could more than double or triple the yield in your farm fields. And people started coming up with inventions for covering the drain tile with soil and for digging the ditches. This is an amazing digging machine from the 1800s. Well, John Johnston wrote about his success. Now, in the 1800s, we are told that most farmers subscribed to at least two journals. And the majority of farmers could read and write. So they were sharing their techniques and people heard about what John Johnson was doing with under drainage. And the people started visiting his farm and seeing how these drain pipes could be placed in the ground and what a difference they made for yields. Well, yes, interest in drain tiles increased and Wharton Bee's little factory in Waterloo, New York started to succeed. So in 1838, Wharton Bee made 3,000 tiles for John Johnston. By 1848, he was making 180,000 clay drain tiles for people in the community. By 1849, he was making over 840,000 clay tiles. News spread faster than wildfire. John Johnston had come up with a better way to raise crops in wet land. But more importantly, by 1871, 
there were 10 factories manufacturing clay drain tile in this little town of Waterloo, New York. And these drain tile were being shipped all over Canada and being placed in the ground to drain wetlands. So by the time of his death, John Johnson had installed 72 miles of buried clay tiles on his 320 acre farm. And when you look at this map, you see faint white lines. Each faint white line is a buried drainage tile system. Now, John Johnson said, when installed correctly, these drain tiles should last forever. Well, he was honored, when he died, he was honored as being called the father of tile under drainage. And this plaque is outside of the home that he lived in near Geneva, New York. And what happened is that an individual who worked for the Soil Conservation Service in the United States, Mike Weaver, he worked to preserve John Johnston's form, home and turn it into a drain tile museum. And this is a great place to visit. They would welcome you. I think they get two or three visitors a year. And when you go to this museum, you see that they have drain tile from all over the world. And you learn how common drain tile were and how they were used to drain wetlands throughout North America. Well, I helped teach a class in New York and we're having another class next year called the Northeastern Wetland Institute. Well, the last time we taught the class, we visited John Johnston's farm. And the person farming it, his name is Eddie Keim, Ed Keim. And he took us out and he said, Tom, let's show the class an area I think you'll find of interest. So we went out to this area and he said, I tried to dig a farm pond here a number of years ago and it doesn't hold any water. Do you have any idea why it doesn't hold water? Well, okay, had an idea. So Ed Keim brought out his old backhoe and he dug a ditch perpendicular to the drainage downhill from the farm pond that did not hold water. And as he dug the ditch, we saw something in the bottom of the ditch that was in the drainage leading from the failed farm pond. And it was a eureka moment. It was a drain tile that had been placed by John Johnston in the early 1800s, and it was still working. Now this drain tile didn't have a bottom. It was placed on bedrock, and there were literally hundreds, if not thousands of them placed in the drainage. So when Ed Keim tried to build that farm pond, he didn't dig deep enough to disable the buried drain tile and they just were doing their job. They were pulling water out of that farm pond. Now, Ed is in the background here. He has the green cap. And if you look closely, you can see a Ducks Unlimited logo on it. And I think John Johnston would have been a little bit surprised to know of the support that Ed Kime has for Ducks Unlimited. Okay, by 1882, there were over 1,140 factories manufacturing clay tile in the US. That's a big business. You know, people have said to me many times, if you want to know if there's drain tile in that field, just go to your local government office and they'll have a record of it. Really? Most of the drainage with drain tile was done in the 1800s? And these agencies were not even around in the 1800s. So of course there are no records of drain tile being placed in fields. Well, people started writing books about drainage. And this is one of the first uses of the word wetland I have seen. And this book was published by International Harvester, and it shows how to install buried drain tile that should last forever. And here are some of the other books that have been written. I will collect all the books about drainage, and it's amazing how many books are out there describing early drainage techniques and how you can improve your farm. And these books talk about the need for deep outlets for drainage systems. See, when you install drain tile, you have to have an outlet. Just like uh, when you drain your bathtub, it goes into either a septic system or a sewage treatment system. But when you drain water out of a wetland, it needs to go into a deep outlet ditch and be carried 
to a stream and eventually to a river. So people formed these drainage districts to dig these deep outlet ditches for their buried drainage systems. And here's an example of one of these deep drainage ditches that collects water from all the farmers' drainage systems. You can see a pipe on the left. That is from a buried uh, subsurface system of drain tiles that are draining wetlands for farming. And here's one out of Surrey. If you spent much time in the lower mainland and you look at these deep ditches, these were all dug by drainage districts so that drainage outlets could be formed in them from the subsurface buried drain tiles. And businesses were formed. Families operated these different types of digging machines so they could put in these deep ditches for drainage. And some of these machines were quite ingenious and they allowed you to dig on saturated soils and not get stuck. Some of these machines, it's just amazing the technology. Uh, some were operated by coal, others were operated by diesel fuel. This is one of the earliest photos I could find of an individual connecting a buried drainage system of clay tiles to an outlet ditch that was dug by a drainage district. This is a ditch digging machine that they used to dig the ditches, then they'd place the clay tiles in the ditch, cover them with soil, and then they would outlet into this deep ditch. And here are these folks are installing the clay drain pipe or the clay, clay drain tile using a ditching machine. A lot of work had to be done by hand. Here's another drain tile operation. Uh, where they're digging the ditch and placing the drain tile in the ditch by hand before it's covered. Maybe you've seen an outlet to a subsurface drainage system like this. This is a really a high quality drainage outlet. First of all, you notice the plastic pipe um, that prevents any type of leakage around the clay tile. And also you notice that uh, the inside of the pipe, there's a predator guard. This prevents animals from going into the drainage system and dying or plugging it up. And then also the sheet piles, this prevents head cuts from forming. If there's ever a major storm with a runoff event, then the water will not cause head cuts to form at the outlet of the buried drainage system. Okay, here's an early drawing showing how buried drain tiles can be used to drain a number of wetlands. I'd like you to try to count how many wetlands were drained using this drainage system. And I'm gonna count here. I see one, two, three, four, five. At least five wetlands were drained using this drainage system. And I have found drain tile systems that are well over three kilometers long and they pick up and drain numerous wetlands. So most of these systems were quite long and went the length of not only one farm, but multiple farms. Well, in the 1970s, clay drainage pipe was replaced by plastic drainage pipe. People came up with this corrugated plastic pipe with slits in it, very narrow slots in it. And they used machines that were laser guided in the 1970s to install long rolls of this plastic drain pipe. And here we see one of these machines being used to install drain line in a wetland. And they're installing four inch diameter slotted drain line here. And it's laser guided system in about 1972. And here we see a dozer equipped with a backhoe attachment for making the outlets to the drainage system. And you can install two or three rolls of this drain line in a day. Farmers were serious about putting water underground and entire streams have been placed in drain pipes like what you see here. And look at the size of this pipe. This was an expensive operation in the 1970s. This was replacing streams underground to drain wetlands for farming. Maybe you've seen a surface inlet like this one here. This one's called a Higginbottom. And this surface inlet is a way to get water into a subsurface drainage system quickly, so fast that it won't drown the crops. And this is a way of adding air to the drainage system or burping it. 
And you may see these in the deepest part of wetlands that have been drained. So here we see a surface inlet in the deepest part of a drained wetland, and it is rapidly injecting water into the subsurface drainage system so the crops will not die. Okay, so how does the surface inlet work? Well, first of all, you place it in the deepest part of a historic wetland. And here there was a rain, about a three inch rain in Eastern Kentucky. So I went out and I photographed this historic wetland that had been drained. The next day I went back and photographed it. And you can see that pipe sticking above the ground about 30 centimeters. I went back the second day and the pipe is sticking above the ground even more and the wetland is quite a bit smaller. By the third day, the wetland was dried. Drainage systems are installed to remove standing water within three days or your crops will drown. And these surface inlets are very effective at removing standing water within three days so the soils will dry out enough for the crops to maintain themselves. Many times these drainage pipes were placed in the bottom of ditches. When people dug ditches to drain wetlands, they caused head cuts to form, tremendous amount of erosion, deep gullies. The government came back and started working with the farmers to reshape the ditches into shallow grassy waterways that would not erode. And in the bottom of these waterways, they placed drain pipes. So here's a typical grassy waterway or a ditch, and it's on a gradual slope that won't erode. But buried in the bottom of a ditch is a buried drain pipe. This drain pipe removes the majority of water and keeps the ditch dry enough so that a farmer can cross it with a tractor and not leave ruts behind. Many wetlands have been filled in. There isn't much documentation of filling of wetlands. It's difficult to get pictures of people filling wetlands because most of them realize they're doing something they shouldn't be doing and they don't want you taking photographs. And here we have a wetland being filled in. You can tell by the different color soil that's used. People generally underestimate how much soil is used to fill wetlands. Oftentimes it's well over three meters of soil that's added to wetlands. And here we have a wetland being filled in. And you know, people will say to me, well, you know, when you build this wetland area, why don't you haul in, you know, why don't you just have your soil that you remove hauled off? Well, what I found out over the years is that much of that soil that's hauled off was used to fill wetland areas. So uh, what people do with excess soil is they generally fill in wetlands with it because many people regard wetlands to have low value. Can you tell where the wetland's been filled in? Yes, it's the road. Many roads have been built across wetland areas and this involves placing massive amounts of fill in wetlands. But oftentimes, smaller wetlands were simply filled using the blade on a tractor. And here this individual is filling in the wetland using the blade of a tractor. And we see this in many fields. If you have water standing in your field, you simply shift the topsoil from high ground to low ground and level out your field. OK, this is a swamp or a forested wetland area. And those of you that spent time in swamps recognize the difficulty of walking in a swamp. You have all these trees that you have to climb over, all these pits where other trees fell over, and there's water standing in puddles, and there's areas that are saturated. Uh, but you know what we find is that these swamps were the first areas that were drained in order to make farm fields. Well, if you spend time in swamps, you'll see that when one of the larger trees falls over, it leaves quite a mound and quite a pit. And if there's a high water table, that pit can contain water. So we've been measuring the uh, tree root masses that fall over in swamps. And this one was four and a half meters high, a big cottonwood that fell over in a swamp. And so what's to show us is that swamps had pit and mound topography. And the mounds and swamps could be four or five meters high, and the pits could be three meters deep. So here is a pasture field, 
And this pasture field was a swamp, but the trees were cut off of it. But they did not fill in the pits or level the mounds. And look at the abundance of water and the mounds in this pasture field. So this is what happens if you cut the trees off a pasture, allow them to re-sprout, and you can see where the trees are growing on the higher ground. Well, people would take the areas of swamp and they would remove the trees, remove the stumps, and then they would level the fields and fill in areas for farming. And people have been using level equipment for many, many years. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1960 and it shows leveling areas for farming. And here we have a fairly advanced operation where entire fields are being leveled and sloped so the water would flow into the ditches. And here is a leveling apparatus. It's being pulled by a dozer. And this is for filling in those depressions that used to be, you know, were formed by the trees falling over in swamps. Now, some people will say that drained wetlands will heal over time if they are left alone. And I hear this quite often. I hear this from people that have a lot of education. They say, you know what? If you just leave that area alone, the wetland will heal and restore itself. Well, they are really mistaken. Once you recognize how greatly our landscape was changed for drainage, you'll understand that it is impossible for wetlands to heal themselves because of the amount of soil that was moved. So think about this for a minute. How can you tell where a wetland has been filled and drained? You see the dozer here. How do we know it's filling a wetland? Well, you can see the cattails that are being buried in the foreground. So how do you really know if a wetland has been filled in? Well, think of a fashion model. These people in these photographs are too perfect. The photographs have been retouched. Plastic surgery has been performed on the individuals because nobody can look this perfect without any blemishes. So when you look at a farm field that is leveled with no blemishes of pits and mounds, you know it's been retouched. You know it's been a wetland that has been completely filled in and leveled and drained and changed. Okay, we're gonna jump into a quiz now, okay? I'd like your help in finding where historic wetlands were located. Every one of these photos shows wetlands that have been drained. And so in this photo right here, I think you can easily see the outline of the drained wetlands and the deep ditches. Now, maybe you remember back to your school days, there was a student who sat next to you in class, maybe tried to copy your paper, and that person hopefully ended up with a D or a C minus. Well, this is a wetland drainage job that was performed by that D plus student. They did such a poor job of digging these ditches that there are still wetlands on the landscape and you can't farm where the wetlands have been drained. So this is a poor example of wetland drainage. And the blue shaded area, that's where the wetlands were located before the ditches were dug. Okay, let's move on here. Can you see where the wetland has been drained? Now this is getting into the B, B plus category of drainage. They had a lot of rain one year and the crops died in that depression. You see wetlands naturally occur in depressions and this depression doesn't have any water in it. So it's been drained and that's where the wetland used to be. Okay, how about here? This is part of the historic black swamp near Lake Erie in Ohio. Can you see where the wetlands used to be? There were at least two wetlands. Now, this is when they had a heavy rain and a snow and frost is starting to come out of the ground and water is pooling on the surface. So there are at least two wetlands that have been drained in this photo. And the blue shading shows them to you. The one, the water standing in it because the drainage system hasn't had time to pull that water into the ground. The other one, you can see a vertical, vertical stake 
which marks a surface inlet that was used to drain the wetland. The stake is there so the farmer doesn't run over the surface inlet with the tractor. How about here? Now we're getting into a little bit better category of drainage. How can you tell that this area was wetland? This area used to be wetland and the signs are right in front of you. Can you tell? First of all, there's reed canary grass. Reed canary grass is a clear sign that a wetland has been drained on the site. Next is the natural rim of the wetland. All wetlands occur in depressions. They have a natural rim surrounding them and the willow are growing on the natural rim. Now a ditch was dug through the natural rim and the red area shows you where the ditch was dug, but they did a sloppy job with their soil and they left it in piles. So you can see the piles on either side of the ditch. So really three signs, four signs of drainage there. How about here, LIDAR image. Are you able to spot where the wetlands used to be? LIDAR is fantastic for finding depressions and ditches, but it needs to be high quality LIDAR. You know, just any old LIDAR won't do. You need something that's expensive and has resolution of like 10, 10 centimeter accuracy. And what you see here are a series of ditches and depressions that used to be wetlands. Quite a few wetlands were drained in this aerial photo. How about here? What do we call this system of farming? Lands, okay? So this is a wetland that's being farmed. It's been drained and we have dead furrows and we have lands, all showing us this used to be a wetland. How about here? Beautiful farm fields, almost too perfect here. They've been all retouched, but this used to be wetland. And there's a really strong clue, really a good clue it used to be wetland. It's the way these two ditches come together at right angles. Anytime you see ditches coming together at right angles, you know you're looking at a drained wetland. So they also dug a diversion ditch on the other side of the hill. Clearly, it used to be wetland. How about here? Now we're getting to the A category of drainage. Yes, this used to be wetland. And there are a number of signs that are visible. Maybe you're looking at the dark line. People will say to you, that represents where buried clay drain tile is. Well, they're wrong. No, there is no clay tile underneath that dark line. So what's going on here? Okay. This field used to be in lands, but a pro pro progressive individual leveled the lands and installed a system of buried plastic drain pipe. But where they filled in the dead furrows, there was a little bit of settling and the sedges remain, which are darker in color. You can't tell where the buried drain lines are, but you can see where the streams were moved and the streams were channeled. Oh, here's an easy one. I know you're gonna get this one. Right away, see that pipe? That's an outlet for a subsurface drainage system. But there are more clues this used to be wetland. There's a diversion ditch at the far side of the hill. There are buried drain lines in a leveled field. And the stream itself is really a ditch, one of these deep outlet ditches that was dug by a drainage district. How about here? Now you're into the A plus category of drainage right here. If somebody does a good job draining a wetland, you really can't tell it used to be a wetland. It's taken three generations of farmers to drain this wetland. This is on John D. Smith's farm in Eastern Kentucky, and he is an expert at drainage. And he told me the story of how this was drained. And I'll give you some clues. First of all, they had to dig a diversion ditch, but instead of running it through the middle of this wetland, they ran it along the edge of the property so that both he and his neighbor would benefit from the diversion ditch. There was a spring coming out from the pin oak trees. So they placed that spring in a buried drain pipe. And then over the years, his grandfather 
his father and John D both installed clay tiles and plastic drain pipes in this field. Now, the field does not have hydric soils because it's been drained. And I brought a group of 13 soil scientists out from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and I showed them this site. And we walked around it, and John D. Smith joined us, and he described how he drained it. And he said when he was a boy, he would plow the field, and he would be in water up to his knees. Well, we started digging some soil test holes, and we found out that the soils were not hydric and there were no models. The soils were well-drained. And three of the group of soil scientists basically accused John D of lying to them, saying this was never a wetland. If it was a wetland, it would have hydric soils. And John D told him, well, if you do a good job draining the wetland, your soils are no longer saturated. So this shows you how difficult it is to identify drained wetlands, especially if the person who drained them is no longer you know, managing the farm. Okay, so many wetland creation projects are really wetland restoration projects, but somebody has done an A plus job of draining the wetland. So I believe that you must take action to disable historic drainage practices to be successful in building a wetland. Otherwise, the drainage system will remove water from your constructed wetland. So here are some points to ponder in summary about building wetlands on farmland. Someone's been there before you. Their living depended on growing crops off the land. They worked tirelessly to remove excess water from their fields. And these folks were every bit as intelligent as we are today. And they were out there all the time working to improve their farm fields. And the drainage systems that they installed were designed to last forever. So even if no one is farming the ground anymore and the field has grown up to trees, more than likely the drainage systems are still working. So attempting to build a wetland without reversing historic drainage, it's a lot like trying to cure cancer with a Band-Aid. You won't be successful. You have to think like that farmer when they first tried to turn that area into a farm field and try to reverse what they have done. So here is a wetland that was drained with hand dug ditches. The trees are growing here because the elevation of groundwater has been lowered by the ditches. This used to be a beaver pond, but it was drained for farming and it was farmed in the 1800s and early 1900s. The good news is these sites can be restored. And here's the same site after the ditches were disabled and the wetland was restored. Beautiful wetland habitat. And we are able to reverse many of these drainage practices and to restore the streams and the wetlands in many places across North America. And we're able to design and build these wetlands to provide habitat for species at risk and for endangered and threatened species. The wetlands we build can be constructed to last forever with little, if any, maintenance required. The wetlands we build can be built to provide habitat for waterfall. This is a two-year-old wetland, and this is a beautiful photo taken with a drone. And if you look closely, you can see waterfall resting on the logs and in the water. And if you take the time to count the number of ducks, you'll come up with 86 ducks using this restored wetland. These wetlands are beautiful to look at and they provide such important habitat to plants and animals. We can now construct wetlands that provide a diversity of wildflowers for pollinators. And we can build wetlands that are swamps, shrub dominated, tree dominated, uh, grass dominated. And the wetlands we build will be used by generations outdoors for science learning, science education. They're just great places to uh, explore. If you'd like to learn more about wetland restoration and construction and drainage, I encourage you to pick up copies of the books that I've wrote 
and uh, read these. And you'll find fascinating stories about drainage and people like yourself who are working to build wetland areas. I really appreciate your time in uh, watching this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions about wetland restoration, please contact me. Thank you.